And we are live. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. There are so many of you here. You guys are keen, seriously keen. Uh, let me know, guys. How's your revision been? Put it in the uh, in the comments here. I'm keen to know. How's everyone feeling? It's getting close now. It's getting close, right? Welcome, everybody. Welcome. There are lots and lots of you here. And great to see you all. Really, really great to see you all. Hope you're feeling all right. Yeah, I hope you're feeling all right. I know for lots of you, it's the first exam tomorrow, starting with a big one, right? Economics paper one, really? To start the exam season? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's how we're doing it. <laughs> no messing around. Hope you guys are feeling good. Hope you've revised really well. This weekend was a key one, right? I've certainly noticed um, this last week, the intensity has gone up a notch. Um, the amount of interaction on social media, the amount of you guys on YouTube has just skyrocketed. So I think you guys are coming in clutch, right? Last minute, get that revision in, get that mastery in. I like it. But welcome everybody to the stream. Great to see you all here. I was uh, proactive with this stream. I asked lots of questions beforehand. I let a lot of you know the stream was going to happen. And you guys have sent in some really good questions to me, some key things you want me to go through. And this stream is very much devoted to you guys smashing paper one, me giving you all the final advice, the final guidance, final tips for you guys just to be ready for tomorrow, to make sure you can perform the best you possibly can tomorrow. So everything I have to give, I'm going to give, all right? So I guess the key thing for you guys, just take it all down. You will be able to rewatch this. As soon as it's over, it's just going to be on the channel. You can watch it in your own time again. But just make sure, yeah, you're attentive, you take it in. There are going to be lots of tips you want to use, even in the last few hours remaining and in the, uh, in the day tomorrow before the exam as well. So just take it all in, right? Take it all in. Uh, just to let you know, guys, um, a lot of you haven't sat public exams before, have you? Certainly not economics exams. Um, so it's quite a big day for you guys tomorrow. But I should stress, economics exams, guys, are not necessarily the easiest in the world. It's not an exam where you can just learn and regurgitate in the exam. That's not how questions are asked. So make sure in your mind you're ready that questions might not be exactly as you would like them to be. And therefore, following these tips and, and the guidance I'm going to give today is going to be crucial. But just listen attentively and take a lot in. It's going to help you big time when it comes to tomorrow's exam. So I think lots of you are here already. We're just going to dive straight in, guys. So here we go. Um, a lot of questions have come through for me. I'm going to cover most of those that I've received today, um, as well as some key things for you to be ready for tomorrow. So let's start, shall we, by talking about diagrams. I've received a lot of questions about diagrams, actually, especially for paper one micro. There are loads, right? Diagrams are king. Diagrams are seriously, seriously important. But there are no rules with diagrams. So when it comes to any kind of essay, it's not like examiners are expecting one or two or three or four. So don't go in there tomorrow thinking, oh, I've got to have this many diagrams in this essay. It doesn't work like that. The only rule with diagrams is that there is no rule. So when do you draw a diagram? You draw a diagram anytime it can illustrate something you're writing. OK, that could be an analysis. That could be an evaluation. But if you're writing something and you think a diagram is perfect to illustrate what you're writing, then you draw the diagram, right? So that might mean you draw three or you draw four or you draw one, doesn't matter. Whenever it's useful to illustrate what you're writing, you draw it. But when it comes to diagrams, draw them big, use a pencil and a ruler. Examiners will like you for that. Make sure you draw them where you're talking about them. Examiners get annoyed if you draw a diagram and then they have to turn a page to see why you're writing about it. So integrate the diagram within your paragraph where you are writing about it, and make sure with the diagram itself, it's got to be accurate. Label the axis, label the curves, label your equilibrium. Make sure you're getting your shifts correct, okay? Don't make it inaccurate and don't miss your labeling. But also make sure that you're actually talking about it in your writing. If you're shifting curves, whether demand to the right or average cost down, whatever, refer to that shift, AC1 to AC2, D1 to D2. Yeah? If there are any changes on the equilibrium, prices going up or quantities going up, refer to that in your writing and you get higher credit 
for that. So diagrams are very powerful tools. In that sense, I have a video, I think a lot of you watched it already, power diagrams for paper one, stunning diagrams, ways in which you can use diagrams to really boost up your mark. Make sure you watch that before tomorrow. There are some real beauties in there that you don't want to miss. That's for sure. That is absolutely for sure. That video is a brilliant one. And last thing I'll say about diagrams. If you haven't already, add this into your notes last minute. I think when you're revising diagrams, it's worth writing in your notes how you would use the diagram in your exam tomorrow. So what topic area would this diagram fit for? How exactly would you use it? Would you use it to bolster analysis? Would you use it in evaluation? Be precise. Just write a little bullet point or two. When would I use the diagram? How would I use the diagram? And then you'll find it very natural. You're writing something and you're thinking, yes, this diagram is going to be useful. OK, so I recommend that in the remaining time before tomorrow's exam. Let's go straight, shall we, into big hitting topic areas. Let's not mess around. In the time you have before tomorrow, again, weigh these topic areas up. I know there are lots of you from different exam boards here. All this advice is relevant for all exam boards. So the big topic areas, market failure, market structures, and the labor market. They're your three biggies. You want to make sure you are a master of all of those topic areas and all the content that you need to know within those topic areas. Let's start by talking about market failure. Make sure in your notes already, you've got market failure learned as you need to. And for me, there are three things to make sure your market failure revision is perfected. First of all, you want to know all the types of market failure that your exam board has told you in the pre-release, but make sure for each type of market failure that you need to know, you have in your notes written a chain of analysis of how that type of market failure results in a misallocation of resources. Have that and memorize that chain so that when the question comes tomorrow, you know exactly how to analyze that type of market failure if you need to. So that's part one. Make sure for each market failure type, you have that chain of analysis written down. Then obviously policies, right? We're all expecting big, long essay questions on policies, whether it's a 25 marker for most of you or a 25, a 20 marker for some of you. We're expecting that big market failure long essay. Normally, it's policy related. So when you're uh, revising policies to solve market failure, do you have your diagram of how the policy works in solving market failure in your notes? indirect tax, subsidy, regulation, tradable pollution permit, state provision, information provision, price controls. They all have diagrams, right? Do you have that in your notes? Check. Make sure you do. Make sure you're comfortable with it. Then again, you want a chain of analysis ready to go. How does that policy solve whatever the market failure is? Have that chain in, learn it. And then you want to have evaluation points ready too. Have a good set of evaluation points ready to go in your notes. So that tomorrow, when this question comes up, you can pick and choose the best one. So that's all fine. Yeah. And the types of market failure your policies. But maybe one unique thing you can do ready for tomorrow is have a few market failure contexts in your notes, some standard ones, some more quirky ones. And for each context, for each real life example of market failure, in your mind, think, what is the type of market failure to that? And what policy solutions could be used to solve that market failure? And when you write down each policy that you think could be used, write down your best evaluation point, your best evaluation point. The reason why this exercise is a really good one is because when these questions come tomorrow, they're going to be tied to a context, right? So ideally, it's a context that you've already covered. Maybe it's alcohol, yeah, minimum pricing for some examples. Maybe it's flood defenses or healthcare or education or vaccines, generally public goods, merit goods, but other examples, whatever. You hopefully have been revising in context. Hopefully it's one of those that come up. But what if it isn't? What if it's something a little bit quirky, a little bit different? If you've done this exercise and you've looked at context, you've looked at the types of market failure for that context and the policies to solve, then if it is something different tomorrow, you're OK because your brain has been ticking. Right. You've been doing that already. So then you can do it again tomorrow if they throw something a bit more weird market failure at you. OK, so that is how you can smash your market failure. I'll also give you some very unique evaluation points that are available for any long essay market failure question. And maybe points that you might not have heard of before or maybe you're not so confident to use, but certainly using these will set you apart from other students. First of all, you can always think whether there could be a market based solution to market failure as opposed to always going a government policy. So by a market based solution. 
I'm not talking a market policy like tradable permits or property rights or something. No, I'm talking literally left to the functions of the free market. And we all know, right, one of the major functions of the free market is the incentive function and how that function basically attracts new firms into the market to fill gaps in the market. It's the profit motive of private firms are attracted into markets when they know there is a gap. By filling a gap, they can make a huge amount of profit. Well, maybe the gap that firms are looking to fill is a way to solve a market failure. So you can think about something like that. Could profit motivated firms spot a gap in the market, fill it, and thereby solve a market failure without the need for government intervention? Very unique evaluation point, something to consider. Second, always weigh up the risk of government failure. Yeah, not enough students talk about government failure and not enough of them talk about it confidently. It's one of the best evaluation points. And you can use that to kind of go away from certain policies because in your mind, they carry too much of a risk of government failure. And maybe it leads you, this argument, this evaluation point, towards other policies where you think the risk is much lower. So just really have government failure good in your head. Great evaluation point. And lastly, you guys can be very concerned about the risk of heavy handed government intervention and how that can take away individual freedom, individual liberty, individual choice. Actually, what are the major benefits of the free market taken away by heavy handed government intervention, like regulation comes to mind, like indirect taxation comes to mind. And if people in the economy and society generally feel like government intervention is heavy handed, like it's too much paternalism, like it's too much nannyism, the government trying to control our lives, when actually we feel it's our responsibility in certain markets to make choices about consuming this good or that good. What are we going to do in return? Well, we're probably not going to follow the policy. We'll just ignore it. Or we'll find loopholes in the policy, ways around the policy to still consume what we want to consume. Or if we feel very strongly about a policy, we could protest against it. Look at vaccine mandates for health workers that were due in the UK. And now a lot of health workers were very angry about that regulation, that mandate. So what do they do? They organized big protests and they got the policy U-turned. So even that point, that evaluation point has got detail to it and could be very useful depending on the market failure they give you. So we know market failure is coming, right? Just specialize a little bit there and just have some stardust ready to go for tomorrow. Um, I'm willing to shout out a few of you, some um, uh, very generous donations coming through. I appreciate all of your support in truth, I'll be honest, the last kind of three, three weeks to a month, you guys have been absolutely stunning. And I've loved it. The interaction you've given me on all the social media, on YouTube as well. I've been reading a lot of the comments there. You guys have been fantastic. So I appreciate all the support. Just look how many of you are here in this live stream a day before your exam. Yeah, you're clearly keen. You clearly want to succeed and good for you. Yeah, good for you. And I'm just really happy. The videos are helping and all the other support is helping you guys out. And I appreciate a lot of you on the stream here with donations. Thank you so much for that. And lots of great comments and questions have come through as well. We keep going. Let's talk about market structures, shall we? So market structures, again, the good thing is examples have been quite clear, all of them, like which market structures you guys should focus on. No doubt you've done that already, but just check your notes, check your revision. You really want to be revising market structures in three parts. First of all, your characteristics, because that's how you'll define the market structure tomorrow. So have that nailed on. Second, your diagrams. All market structures have diagrams. They illustrate how firms in that market structure behave. Just make sure in your notes, you've not just drawn the diagram, but you actually have done what I said before. You know, how are you going to use this? For what purpose are you going to use it for? That's a very powerful exercise. So take oligopoly. I've had loads of questions about oligopoly. Some exam boards, right, they require you to learn king demand. So if you're learning king demand, you should be writing in your notes, what am I going to use this for? Am I going to use this to show price rigidity in oligopoly? Am I going to use this to show competitive oligopoly? Am I going to use this to show even why you can get collusive oligopoly? Write down how you're going to use it. Lots of you need to learn game theory for oligopoly. Again, that's a diagram, but write down in your notes, right? How are you going to use this? What for? Again, for competitive oligopoly, for collusive oligopoly, for short run, long run evaluation of collusion. So have that for your diagrams in market structures. How are you going to use them? When are you going to use them? But lastly, Make sure you have your pros and cons, and hopefully in your notes, they are dominated by efficiency. Major tip for you, know your efficiencies well, because when you're talking about your market structures, analyzing them or evaluating them, yeah, it's going to be efficiencies that dominate your pros and cons and your evaluation. So know your efficiencies well, know how to develop them 
as pros and cons. It will make essay planning for these market structures very easy. It will make coming out with points very easy. So for market structures, that's the key. Now, again, some great showy off the evaluation points for market structures essays. Again, depends on the question and the market structure that you're discussing, but some novel ideas for you to think about. First, always think about natural monopoly markets. Natural monopoly is great evaluation to competitive markets. Yeah, the one time we don't want competition is in a natural monopoly. Yeah, at the same time, a regulated natural monopoly is a great thing. Yeah, so it's a pro of a monopoly. So remember it that way too. Next, you can always think about contestability of markets. Nice evaluation against the harms of monopoly or oligopoly. Yeah, when you're worried about concentrated markets, you can always say, well, look, if the market is contestable, maybe we don't need to be so concerned. That threat of entry can make incumbent firms act more efficiently, act more in the public interest. And here is a really great evaluation point you can always bring in when you're evaluating market structures. And that is weighing up static versus dynamic efficiency. One of my favorite secret evaluation points. Now, normally, we as society, we value static efficiency allocated productive and ex-efficiency. Because in the end, it means we get low prices and high consumer surplus, high quantity, high quality, high choice, all of these crucial benefits. But in some markets, we as consumers might be willing to forego some static efficiency in order to have dynamic efficiency. Take a simple example, electronics. I think many of you here are willing to pay higher prices, we do already, to get regular reinvestment and innovation tech advancement in electronics, right? So maybe in some markets, we actually prefer dynamic efficiency over static efficiency, in which case that's not a great thing in a competitive market where you're not really going to get much dynamic efficiency. Vice versa, in monopoly, maybe actually the dynamic efficiency benefits of monopoly outweigh the static inefficiencies if consumers value dynamic efficiency more than static efficiency. Would be a quality thing to say. To help you even further make a judgment from that point, you can say, look, in luxury markets like electronics, yeah, that's probably true we probably do weigh dynamic efficiency up more than static. We're willing to pay more for that regular reinvestment. But in necessity markets, yeah, key important markets, goods and services for general, um, for general living, right? Probably you'd argue, no, static efficiency is more important than dynamic efficiency there. But that's a great evaluation point to bear in mind. Um, also in this topic, I said it in my Hot Topics video, right? Watch out for monopoly regulation, privatization, deregulation and nationalization. It's a topic that's very much lumped at the end of market structures. Yeah. So the idea is you've got your market structures nailed. Now, for any of them that we don't like, is there anything we can do to improve them? Well, those four policies are options. Now, tomorrow, they could be essays on their own, big, long essay questions on their own. Yeah. But you might get a market structures essay that's tied to those policies or ideas linked to those policies. Discuss, for example, whether there should be intervention in this market structure. Discuss whether competition authorities should uh, investigate further or regulate further in this market structure, something along those lines. Yeah, so you're tying market structures with the topic of monopoly regulation, privatization, deregulation, national, nationalization. And I know from reading lots of comments, especially on YouTube and, and on my other social medias, I know a lot of you have been revising those policies well. Just make sure you have, okay? Know the policies, know the pros and cons, and you'll be absolutely fine. The last topic I want to talk about, guys, labor market, labor market. I know a lot of you, yeah, tactically are thinking, do you know what? Is there a way I don't have to worry about labor market and just answer other questions? Well, maybe, but I want you to kind of feel like labor market's an option for you. Yeah, it's technical. Yeah, at times it's a bit complex with the theory, but actually they can be very nice long essay questions that come your way, you know? And you don't want to reject them simply because it's labor market and you're thinking, oh, I don't like it. You want it to be an option for yourself. So maybe to help just mentally you feel better about labor market. Think about labor market, the topic, in two ways. The first part of your learning of labor market is just building up the market itself, knowing about demand for labor, knowing about supply of labor, and then knowing about equilibrium in a competitive labor market and how at equilibrium in a competitive labor market. Workers are paid equal to MRP. So wages are equal to the productivity of workers, equal to MRP, one conclusion. Second, we get maximum employment in a competitive labor market at equilibrium. Third, in theory, there'll be no wage differentials, no significant long run wage differentials between various occupations. So you get to there. That's kind of like your first chapter of labor market. 
Your second chapter is then going into labor market failures, right? So breaking down all the assumptions of a competitive labor market, what labor market failures can occur. For example, significant long run wage differentials. At the same time, monopsony power in the labor market. At the same time, trade union power in the labor market or your three major labor market failures or imperfectly competitive labor markets. So in that chapter, it's really just learning why they occur, what the implications of those imperfections are, and then if relevant, what policies can be used to deal with them. That's it. That's it. And actually, it's in chapter two, you often get the big 25 markers or 20 markers. And yes, you guys have seen from my Hot Topics video, right? I'm weighing up trade unions this year trade unions. A lot of examples haven't really asked trade unions for a long time, but there has been a big trend in the UK of slowing membership. Trade union density uh, prior to the 1970s was around 55% in the UK. As I'm talking now, density is only 22, 23%. Significant drop off in trade union membership. Um, so that would fit in under chapter two. But generally, just know your labour market well, maybe look at it like that, how I've broken it down. And maybe you think, Do you know what, actually, it's not that bad to revise. It's not that bad to have a story in my head of what's going on with the, all this technical theory. Okay. We'll take a bit of a pause again. Thank you so much, guys. So many of you are supporting me um, on the live stream here. So many lovely comments and things. I try and read them all, maybe not on the stream here, but certainly on my other uh, social media, especially on Twitter and stuff. I love Twitter. Some of the memes you guys send are just too funny. Uh, wonderful. And also on YouTube. I try my best to keep on top, and I appreciate all the incredible support you guys give. It means a lot. It keeps me buzzing to do stuff like this. And I do get very nervous for live streams, you know, so uh, the support helps, that's for sure. <laughs> uh -huh. So, yeah, I think uh, we keep going, guys. Now, for paper one itself tomorrow. This is probably the most important thing I'm going to say in this entire stream. And that is you want to have strategies in place. I said at the start, for lots of you, this is your first public exam, full stop. Yeah, a lot of you haven't sat GCSEs. You've not really been in that environment before. So it's a big deal for you guys tomorrow. At the same time, it's the first exam for lots of you of the exam season, right? You start with a huge economics exam. Um, what you don't want to happen is for something to go slightly wrong tomorrow, which could have been avoided, because the gap for paper two is two weeks. So then for two weeks, you'll just be stewing about it. You'll just be sitting there frustrated at yourself, annoyed at yourself for making errors in paper one that you could have avoided. And I'm saying the chances for these little errors to creep in are much greater if you don't have strategies in place now to avoid them occurring. Because let's be honest, you guys are not warmed up for exams yet. You've not done any exams yet. You're not in the groove of sitting exams. So what you really need to think about hard is how you're going to nail this paper tomorrow and how you're going to have strategies whereby everything that you can control goes right tomorrow. So one simple example is time management. Trust me, you will be under time constraints, significant time pressure tomorrow. All economics exams are like that. So you need to go in with a really strong method, strategy of how you're going to make sure you don't run out of time. You don't want to learn from that mistake for paper two. You want to avoid that error. And I'll give you my advice. When I sat my economics exams, both A-level and at university, I was under time pressure constantly because it's an essay subject. You're always under time pressure. But I used the clock in the exam room. I stared down the clock and I had tips linked to that. If you guys have got digital watches, more so than these ones, digital is better for this tip. What I would do is if you're starting to write an essay and let's say for that essay, you've got 20 minutes, no more than 20 minutes. You know, you've got 20 minutes. And maybe tomorrow that means that at the end of 20 minutes, it's three o'clock. Yeah. In which case you stare down the clock, you look at three o'clock and, you know, by three o'clock, you are done. The benefit of having that in your head and being so strong with it is because as you start writing your essay, you keep looking at three o'clock and seeing where the time actually is. You will know where you are. You will know if you're under time pressure. You will know if you need to speed up. You will know if maybe you need to cut a point out or something. You will know what to do to make sure that you meet that three o'clock deadline when it comes to time management. So just going in, whatever strategy it is, go in with a hard strategy. Be so tough on yourself tomorrow. If you start with the short questions, don't just ease in and be slow. Right? right from the start, be militant. Have a strategy for time management because from experience, when exams were on prior to COVID, that was the number one complaint everybody had with paper one. Oh, I wish I managed my time better. 
Yeah, you know it's going to be tricky. Have a strategy in place. Think about that for tomorrow. Second, to help you even more with time management, essay planning. Again, this is a bit subjective, but I think most of you here either already do it or kind of want to do it, especially the long essay, either your 25 marker or your 20 marker. I strongly recommend a very quick essay plan before you dive into writing. Two, three minutes of a brief skeleton of what you're going to write in the structure that you need to follow. It's just going to save you time when you're writing, because then when you're writing, you're just going to be writing. You don't need to stop and think. You just motor along. Write, 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 write fast. OK, so keep the plan simple, but have a plan. It will save you time overall if it's two, three minutes of planning. Totally worth it. That way you're unlikely to go over time, especially with the essays. Next, every single exam board here will have extracts somewhere in paper one. Those extracts are written for you to use them. If you read examiners' reports, examiners always say it's in the spirit of extract questions for students to use the extracts. Now, what examiners are saying is basically they want every point that you're writing in extract related questions to be driven by the extracts. And that's how you should use them. Yeah. Let the extracts drive your points, whether it's an analysis, whether it's an evaluation and final judgment, if relevant, on a long essay question. Let the extract drive your points and then you add the economic theory to that. OK, so that's how to use the extracts. Well, maybe that means you're explicitly quoting. Fine. But even if you're not explicitly quoting, yeah, it should be obvious if what you're writing is relevant to the extract or not. So that's number one. Use the extracts well. But also when it comes to the extracts, I do not recommend um, before you look at any questions, reading all the extracts through. I recommend read the extracts as part of your question time. So you read your question first and that question, whatever it is, is normally linked to a certain extract or two, in which case you can read the relevant extracts to that question. And as you progress through the questions, you end up reading all the extracts anyway. But you're only reading the extracts that you need for whatever question you're trying to answer. It's a much better way of doing it than trying to read them all and hoping you've retained all the knowledge. I don't recommend that. So read the extracts when you need them and the extract reading time is within the question time that you have, okay? Uh, next, strategize. Yes, I get a lot of questions. Oh, should I use macro in paper one? And then for paper two, am I okay to write some micro? The answer is absolutely fine, guys, absolutely fine. Examiners actually love a bit of a synoptic element in these papers, you know. They know that economics is a holistic course, right? The two uh, parts of the course, micro and macro, complement each other quite a lot. So if in paper one tomorrow, you think it's relevant, maybe to go into government finances and budget deficits, national debt concerns, if you're talking about a policy being really expensive, for example, and then how that could burden future generations, no problem, if that's relevant to what you're saying. Um, maybe you're talking about risks of inflation, if it's trade union membership or minimum wages, for example. Maybe then you're linking to export competitiveness worsening, current account deficits widening because of that concern. No problem. If you're linking to unemployment from various policies, no problem at all. Yeah. My only advice is if you are going to talk about macro, make sure the entire point isn't macro. Yeah. As in like the whole paragraph. Otherwise, that's a bit weird, isn't it? For paper one, if your entire analysis point or your entire evaluation point is macro, that's a bit awkward. That's a bit odd. So what I'm saying is macro elements to micro points or micro ideas. Fine. Absolutely fine. But stay away from the whole paragraph being macro, if you know what I mean. Okay. But examiners actually like that a lot and they reward you highly if you do it successfully. And last thing I'll say in terms of strategizing for tomorrow, being ready for tomorrow, just watch out for awkward wording in questions. All right. I said it at the start of the screen. I said economics exams are not really just learn and regurgitate. Yeah. Normally, the questions that come up in exams make you think a bit about what content is relevant and then you have to pick and choose an answer. So in that sense, guys, basically, don't worry about it. I see a lot of you are messaging me and uh, I'm seeing emails and whatever on Twitter saying, oh, you know, I really hope it's this question or it needs to be like this. Otherwise, I'm screwed. I'm in trouble. No, you're not. No, you're not. Believe in the content knowledge you have. Believe in the hard work you've done. And if there are awkward questions, maybe in topic areas you like, don't let that put you off. Don't let it put you off at all. Just take a breath at that time. Pause. And go through a checklist. First thing, what topic area is that question linking to? Work that out first. Then think, in that topic area, what content knowledge do I have 
that could be relevant in answering that question. And then brainstorm, think, do I have points available to answer that question? And now, if the answer is yes to all of that, then even if the question is worded a bit awkwardly, not maybe exactly as you would like, you can still maybe write a great essay there. It's still an option for you instead of just rejecting it based on one word or two words that you don't like. OK, I'm telling you because it's going to happen tomorrow. All economics exams are like that. The, the question styles, the wording might not be exactly as you would like, but don't let it put you off. You guys are very good students. You'll be able to manage yourself in that situation and you'll still be able to write a great essay. So to be ready for that. Right? Don't just be revising, hoping it's going to be one question. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Know that you are flexible. You have content knowledge that you can pick and choose re uh, regardless of the wording of the question that comes. And last thing I want to say, guys, is just how to use this final time now before your exam. It's a PM exam, afternoon exam tomorrow. So you've got the rest of tonight. You've also got a good chunk of tomorrow, right? My best advice is don't overload yourself, especially tomorrow. Don't overload yourself. You don't want to be tired by the time you're sitting in the exam. I recommend keep the content ticking over tomorrow. Be a master of the content. Go into the exam so, so happy, so ready with mastery of content in your head. You might find that planning a few essays, especially of some of the hot topics I mentioned in my videos could be a useful thing to do, but don't overload yourself with essay plans. And certainly don't be writing loads of essays. You'll tie yourself out. You'll tie your brain out. You want to be sharp for whatever your time is tomorrow, two o'clock or whatever you're going to be starting tomorrow. So I think content is the key. Go in there sharp and you'll be set. And last thing from me, guys, is yeah, it's your first exam. It's your first big economics exam as well. But I want you guys to have confidence. Honestly, what I've seen the last two, three weeks is incredible. You know, just how dedicated you are to be doing the best you possibly can for this exam. It's clear for me to see how much you guys are watching the videos on the channel, the interaction on social media. It's clear you guys are working so hard. You're putting in the hard yards to be as successful as you can be tomorrow, to hit your potential tomorrow. I want you guys to have confidence in that hard work you've put in, to have confidence in that ability. So whatever examiners try and do tomorrow, it doesn't matter. You're one step ahead because you've worked hard. You've been dedicated. You've got the content knowledge there. You've got the exam technique there. You've got the application there. You've got the skills there to perform to the best of your ability tomorrow. Go in there with that mindset that tomorrow is an opportunity for me for me to show the examiner how good I am at economics, how much hard work I've put in, to show how confident I am, to show how much I love the subject. Yeah, think of it as an opportunity tomorrow, regardless of how they word the questions, regardless of if, if it's exactly the topic area you want or the context that you want. It doesn't matter. It's your time to shine. Feel good in yourself. Feel happy in yourself. Have the strategies I talked about and go in there and boss that exam. Yeah. And then let me know how it goes at the end. I'm sure you guys will smash it. And then it's on for paper two. And when it comes to paper two, there is loads more to come from me. I've got lots of plans. I've already made a few clutch videos for you guys. We go again. We're on this journey together. So really enjoy it tomorrow, guys. Don't feel nervous. nervous and nervousness is normal. It means you care. Yeah. Use those nerves to your advantage. Let it make you be incredible tomorrow. And just know whatever happens, you're going to be great. So thank you all so much for tuning into this live stream. A lot more to come from me. I'm with you all the way. I can't wait to hear what you say about tomorrow and how it's gone, but we'll go again for paper two. Stay tuned to the channel. Keep on top of all the social media as well. And I'll see you again very soon. But go out tomorrow, guys. I'm with you all the way. You're going to do great. Trust me. Thanks very much, folks. See you later.